Hi, I'm indie fantasy author Melinda Cusera, and today W.D. Kilpack III joins me to discuss the first book in his series, New Blood, Crown Prince. What's it about? So let's find out. Let's let's meet W.D. So welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks. Why don't you tell us about your book? Well, uh, Crown Prince is uh, book one of the New Blood saga, and uh, in a nutshell, Nathar is guardian of Merrick. And he and others before him have protected mankind since the old gods walked. Uh, with sight, Nathar sees what will be, and as his father did before him, planned for decades to save the newborn crown prince, Vikari, and help him reclaim the throne from the tyrannical Brant of the Green. So that's sort of in a nutshell of, of book one. Well, let's let's meet those characters. Let's get into it. All right. <laughs> get that book out. Let's 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 get that excerpt going so we can get a the flavor of the book and um and hear your writing style and and most importantly meet the characters and discover their world. Okay. Chapter one, sight. Green eyes bored into the shadows, grim and intent, as a hundred possibilities played themselves out for the benefit of his sight alone. He sat just as he had for hours, chin resting in his palm, an elbow propped on his knee. His calloused palms were dry, despite the adrenaline flooding his frame, as some of those possibilities spelled out certain damnation for the king, the nation, and all mankind, be it a'a -a or firstborn, until his eyelids finally lowered, moistening his pained eyes. He had not blinked for a seeming lifetime, unwilling to chance missing some scant detail, despite knowing full well that everything he saw was in his mind, channeled by his gift. Of course, there were times that his sight seized him so fiercely that he would not have been able to blink, regardless of his desires one way or the other. He rolled his eyes gently beneath his lids. They felt sticky, like a pair of fish laying out in the sun too long. For hours, he had not moved from his seat, an, ornate, an ornately carved bench made from the king's favorite cherry wood. It had leather cushions shaped like spread wings held in place by brass rivets all around the outer edge. Nathar finally opened his eyes and frowned at the thick rug covering the dark stained oak floor. It also bore the spread wings of the King of Merrick, most powerful king to the rill of the Gulf of Brog. This time the wings were golden in a sea of deep red. Nathar breathed deeply, but otherwise was the same statue he had been since taking up his sentry post long before dawn the previous day. To his left were wide double doors, their dark wood ornately carved with a caravan of eagles circling skyward like a festival dancer's ribbons, twirling in endless rings. Beyond, the queen cried out yet again, her pain palpable. Her son, the heir of Merrick, was hard pressed to escape the tiny woman's womb. The midwives came and went, as did clergy of Vald the Chaste, Rill the Bold, Kier the Strong, and Bord the Radiant, representatives of all four of the old gods' sects, coming to offer the goodwill of their masters upon the birth. There were sects of the new gods in town but the new gods' clergy were laughable excuses for men of faith. As often as not, they were seen drunk on the, f on the few alms they managed to collect in lands such as Merrick. On this side of the Gulf of Brog, the old gods still held a place of respect, if, if not more, despite the age-old treaty that dictated otherwise, proclaiming the new gods' places as official religions and relegating the old gods to the realm of pagan sects. Yet still, the old gods were nearly as strong in some places as before. The treaty ended the A'a uh -uh conquest, which was a substantial accomplishment, but its effects ended there, despite the generations born and died in its wake. It was one of the things Nathar often used as an example when advising the king in matters of state. A king could dictate policy, but he could not dictate what his people felt in their hearts. Here, the old gods were still supreme, 
complete with all their conflicting practices. The followers of Rill would always be at odds with the followers of Kier. It was Rill who created the firstborn when the world still belonged to the great beasts and the old gods still walked. For eons, the firstborn ruled until Kier finally created the Aa. Thus came the greatest war of all time, which split the world and exterminated entire races of, of living creatures. The firstborn ultimately lost that war, the Aa conquest. The last survivors who did not surrender were forced down across the continent to the end of the world, an island across the long water. It was then that the treaty was signed, ending the war, declaring the new gods of the Aa predominant. Now, all men this side of the long water called themselves Aa, although many might claim to have the blood of the firstborn in their veins, if they thought they were among friends. Declaring it too openly might lead to trouble, and no one in their right mind wanted another war on the scale of the Aa conquest. Of course, regardless of claims of having first blood, the closer Nathar got to the long water, the more he was likely to believe it. When he traveled down through the world toward the long water, People got taller and broader through the shoulders, bore fewer children, and seemed to live to a much greater old age. Of course, Nathar had first blood, that was clear. He stood ahead taller than most men, and he had the firstborn ability that made him the guardian of Merrick. Sight. Nathar sighed, returning from his historical musings to the present, to the way the clergyman bustled about the chamber in and out through those ordinately carved doors. That the clergyman had arrived at the palace at all was nigh on miraculous. Erig, the capital city of Merrick, had been under siege for weeks. The riverside gate breached twice. It was a tribute to the cleric's faith in King Velain that they maintained peace with one another. Although the followers of Rill and Kier both would wholeheartedly support Velain taking arms taking arms to protect his crown. Exactly how to go about it would be a matter of debate. And where the high priest of Rill carried an ornamental sword and the high priest of Kier carried a mace as tall as a firstborn, those debates never went well. One would advise deft moves and counter moves, the virtues of an adept mind and finely tuned body, conducting a battle like an elaborate duel of swords. The other would call him a coward unwilling to give himself over to the protection of the war god, stand and crush his foes with his own hands or die gloriously. <clears throat> Nathar sighed and closed his eyes again, his dark hair falling down about his face to shroud his bl black mustache and narrow spike of whiskers below his bottom lip. In recent years, the firstborn had been even more paramount in the people's thoughts. Queen Lanilla had come from Nordal, one of the two realms on the firstborn island, in order to wed Velaine. It was the most momentous wedding since the Aa conquered the firstborn. In the generations since the end of the Aa conquest, it was the first time a king of Merrick would take a firstborn woman as his queen. The bitter irony was that she was such a tiny woman. Nathar had known her ultimate fate since first meeting her but could not resist loving her, as his queen, if not more. If she had not been destined to wed Velaine, even for so short a time, Nathar would have taken a place as one of her suitors to see if his love might grow beyond that a loyal, a loyal man paid his liege lady. Nathar could still remember the first time he saw her. Lanilla came to Erig for the wedding festival leaving her island for the first time. She was the tender age of 15, stunning with red gold hair and a beaming smile. When he looked at her, he was unable to look away, seized by her as strongly as ever the demon of sight, the vision of her holding him rooted. Of all the women who came to the festival in hopes of catching the young king's eye, she alone held the rapt attention of everyone within a league. She was beautiful, intelligent, charming, and she had a rich laugh that sailed on the air with a life all its own. 
Villain had feigned interest in the dozens of women come to the festival to dance and sing and feast to the fertility of the land. But Lanilla of Nordal was a handful of starlight cupped in the hands of a god and nestled there for them all to bask in her glow. Nathar let out another labored sigh. By the end of the festival, as was custom, Belaine announced his engagement. The guardian knew who it would be as surely as he could predict the sun rising in the morning. Where before kings might have shied away from a firstborn bride, Belaine was so taken, there was no other option, first blood be damned. Many whispered that she was not truly from across the long water being so slight. In retrospect, they were simply trying to make excuses for their king for taking such an action. Other kings would not look well on him for taking a firstborn as queen, be it a ah kings from across the Gulf of Brog, or those with family lines leading back for generations, fearing that more a ah invaders would come to take more of their realms. Of course, the loudest outcry was truly from nobles angry that their own daughters were not chosen for the throne. The outcry passed, but not soon enough. After only five years, Lanilla would leave the world and all its troubles behind. She had spent too long worrying over the enmity of her subjects, not enough time enjoying their affection when she finally proved herself a just and caring queen. Nathar almost envied her for her coming release. She would not, she would not watch her husband lose his throne, then his life. In fact, all she would know when she left the realm of the living was the joy of a healthy son to one day rule over Merrick in all its greatness. Nathar did indeed envy her escape from the troubled years on the horizon. He had seen many of the events coming and the land was in for years of hard times. He alone knew that the next decades would ravage the hearts and souls of a generation. Gazing grimly at the floor, he knew as only the guardian of, Mer of Merrick could. The drum of boots on the oak floor yanked Nathar out of his reflections and drew him instantly to his feet. His long sword hissed free of its scabbard and he twirled his green cloak loosely around his free hand, winding it around his forearm to keep it from entangling his legs or if necessary, as a shield. The warm glow of wall lamps reflected off his silver chest plate emblazoned with the king's spread wings and red gold, and a short skirt of chainmail draped down from its front halfway down his thighs. Above it was a worn silver brooch holding his green cloak in place, tooled into the likeness of a screaming eagle's, eagle's head, still clear despite years of wear. It had been a gift from King Villain as the guardian of Merrick and a friend. <laughs> he lifted his chin even as the point of his weapon rose and his emerald eyes sparked with menace. His bare arms, corded with muscle, flexed as he willed his limbs to loosen after so many hours of immobility. The sound of, football, the sound of footfalls muted as they reached the edge of the long rug, leading down to the adjoining corridor to the royal bedchamber. Its mate was under the guardian's boot soles. The approaching tread was steady, powered by the assurance of seasoned soldiers. Absently, Nathar realized that he could smell the distant lilt of smoke. For all he knew, the gate could be breached for the last time. Lord Nathar, a deep voice boomed, even before the soldiers came into sight. Don't run me through. I come with word for the king. There was a moment of silence. Then six men rounded the corner. They were dressed similarly to Nathar but for the red cloaks that matched the rug, silvery plates trimmed in red gold covering their thighs, matching greaves fronting their shins and helms clutched under their arms with protective nose and cheek pieces. Three of their chest plates boasted crisscross, crisscrossing gouges and scratches from recent combat. The foremost of the men stopped abruptly, blinking at Nathar. He was a grizzled soldier with iron gray hair, 
pulled tightly back in a tail that made his deep widow's peak all the more apparent. It had not been nearly so pronounced even a handful of years ago. He wore a matching screaming eagle brooch made of silver, the mate to the, the, mate to the one worn by the guardian. <clears throat> Nathar, he said, voice even as he nodded toward the guardian's drawn weapon. Then he smiled wearily. I suppose someone could have disguised his voice to sound like mine. But wouldn't your sight see through it? Nathar did not move. His sword remained raised, his eyes unblinking. He was as much a statue as he had been on the bench. Moments passed, and it must have appeared that he did not so much as breathe. The soldiers exchanged wary glances. Lord Carl, one with a scarred chest plate said slowly, he's seized by sight even now. He swallowed, blue eyes slightly wide. His pale blonde hair was loose about his shoulders. Even as seasoned a soldier as he was, he gazed at Nathar with a child's awe. Don't touch him, Carl warned, although his lieutenants all knew that very well. He's killed men for rattling him when seized by the demon of sight. Carl shook his head, watching the larger man. Nathar remained frozen, broad jaw flexed. Then, very slowly, his lips drew into a thin line. Carl grunted in response, then said softly, Whatever his sight affords him, it seems dire news indeed. Lord Carl, the same man said, dropping his own voice to a whisper. We must make our report. Perhaps, Niels, Carl said, eyes on the guardian of Merrick. Niels let out a thin breath and said, I'll, I'll stand between you and Lord Nathar sh should we chance to disturb him. Carl chuckled mirthlessly. I doubt very much he wouldn't give a more detailed report than we, once he's free of his sight. He glanced quickly at the blonde man, senior of his lieutenants. His blonde hair tended to make people think he was younger when, in fact, he had gray in his hair at the temples, but it did not stand out against his blonde hair without close scrutiny. Niels, you seem eager to test your steel against him. Niels grimaced, shaking his head. Of course not, he snapped, but our duty is to the king. And how will you fulfill that duty when Nathar has removed your head? Carl asked dryly, not smiling. I've known Nathar nearly all my life. We can return to the walls now. Nathar knows everything that we might have reported. He paused, glancing at Niels meaningfully, and more. Niels sighed heavily, glancing at the other lieutenants. He had served under Carl for 20 years. The others, so much younger, had eyes only for the towering warrior who still stared blindly at them, blocking the way to the royal bedchamber. A shrill wail split the relative silence, and Nathar flinched as if slapped across the face. Carl and his lieutenants all took one step back in unison, Niels and the other two with scarred chest plates, <clears throat> each half drawing their swords. God's the queen, one of them gasped. Nathar focused on them, lowering his sword slightly. Carl, he said in scarcely a whisper, as he brought down his weapon another hand span. His gaze flicked, pack, flicked, past, Nath flicked past Carl's sh shoulder toward the lieutenants, and he sheathed his sword in a fluid motion. When he spoke again, his voice was curt. Niels, Jock, Chadley, Porl, Wyand, he said, greeting each in turn. Your sergeants are good men, but they should not be left without your leadership, particularly now. Niels blinked, glancing at the others again. What do you mean? We all came together because we had re because we had forced the usurper's men back. This is the best time for us to speak to the king directly. Nathar's green eyes hardened. If you return with all speed, you will have time to prepare your men for the usurper's reinforcements but you must go now. The lieutenants exchanged glances again. Then Niels said, reinforcements? Our sentry saw no reinforcements. He glanced at the younger lieutenants a second time. We have the best eyes in all of Merrick on the watch. Nathar smiled thinly, 
fatigue shadowing his features. We fight men who live their lives in the Aragon Mountains, he said slowly, clasping his hands in front of him. Every day they stalk great beasts in, the, in their dense woods. I have walked among them. I have spent a lifetime learning the ways of the forest, the secrets of the wood. Yet still, I learned from them. He let the words settle in for a long moment. <clears throat> then asked, do you think making a stealthy approach through the trees is beyond them? His grin widened, although his eyes remained lethal pinpoints of emerald steel. We are ah, uh -uh, not great beasts. We do not have the ears of the deer nor the nose of a wolf. It's far easier to fool a man than to fool a great beast. Nathar frowned at them until every pair of eyes turned toward the floor, then swung his gaze around to home in on their captain. Carl, how is it that you allow your lieutenants to so question my authority? Is this the discipline you teach? Lord Nathar, Carl began, scoring his shoulders. But the lieutenants cut him off as they all touched their fingertips against the center of the red gold wings on their chest plates. It made a, sing it made a single soft tap. Your sight is true, guardian, they said in one voice. Forgive us, Niels added, inclining his head respectfully, then spun on his heel in a flurry of his deep red cloak. Come, we, we must make... We must make ready for what the guardian has seen. Another scream from behind the door made Nathar and Carl flinch. The green cloak guardian seemed to shrink, his eyes closing. The weight of knowledge weighed heavily on him. Carl, he scarcely whispered. If Queen Lanilla survives childbirth, she will not last long after. Nonsense. Carl stated simply. She has the finest healers and midwives in the land, falling all over themselves to see that she... His voice trailed off at the grim expression on Nathar's face. Carl twitched again, clearly shaken, some of the color leaving his bewhiskered cheeks. You... You've seen this? The dark-maned man did not move for a long moment, then gave a barely perceptible nod. Good gods, Carl hissed. Dark eyes losing focus. Queen Lanilla, so young. Indeed, Nathar answered, voice thick with emotion despite his resolve to remain neutral. The captain frowned at him for a long moment, eyes pained. I do not envy you your sight, Nathar. Knowing this was coming, his voice trailed off again. Nathar nodded, rubbing his eyes with thumb and forefinger then pinched at the bridge of his nose. When he lifted his head, his face had returned to its usual, unreadable mask. The only thing unusual about it were the gray shadows filling his eye sockets, the whites of his eyes so riddled with swollen veins that they were more pink than white. Carl shook his head. How long have you stood watch, he asked softly. You look like the Riverside Gate. That bad, Nathar scarcely whispered then straightened even more, squaring his shoulders and releasing scattered soft pops from down his spine as he straightened it. When he spoke, his voice was flat and, and as hard as his chest plate. That you haven't returned to the walls with your lieutenants means that you have questions. Are they for me? The captain frowned, then nodded curtly. There are rumors, Nathar, Carl said slowly meeting the taller man's gaze. Men on the walls are worried that your absence from the fighting is a bad omen. They claim that your sight has told you that we will not win this war of succession. Only whispers, mind you, but even that can poison morale. He watched the taller man carefully, his dark eyes intent. I will ask only a single question. He paused, waiting for Nathar's nod, then asked, have you seen our defeat. Nathar smiled easily. No, he answered without hesitating. It was a lie, delivered with the skill Nathar had been forced to develop over time. Having sight was as much a blessing as it was a curse. It was times like this that he regretted his first blood. Carl relaxed visibly. Clearly, that doubt had weighed more heavily on him than he had let on. 
Despite their long friendship, the Guardian wondered if there really were any whispers or if the captain was voicing his own concerns. Sight is not perfect, Nathar explained. Most often, I see paths, not destinations. Where I see the end with the clarity of fine crystal is rare indeed. Thus, I help train soldiers to be masters at arms in places that I have seen to be destined for hardship. He smiled grimly. I'm sure that you would agree. When the end is in doubt, there is no surer divining rod than a yard of honed steel. Carl chuckled, relaxing further. You've trained us well, Nathar, he said, smiling more easily. So why do you watch so closely over the birth of the king's heir? This has been a long, hard siege. Your mere presence on the walls would bolster the men's spirits. Brant's claim has always been based on his blood ties to the throne, Nathar said coolly. He claims his link to the throne is stronger than the king's. It's foolish, of course. All the same, an heir for Valain would only extend this bitter war. He paused half a beat, then continued. I'm here to stop those who would slip in unseen and spill the blood of a newborn child. They wouldn't, Carl snapped, aghast. Even Aragon savages respect the lives of innocents. Nathar let out a long breath. I have seen it, he said softly. Carl's face hardened until a tiny tick flicked at his cheek. I will kill their soldiers to a man, he said, voice little more than a growl. I vow it. Nathar nodded, reaching out to rest a hand on the cold steel covering Carl's shoulder, then patted it, calloused palm wrapping softly against the hard steel. As much as your lieutenants should not long leave their sergeants, neither should you abandon your, your lieutenants, he said mindfully. Of course, Lord, Nath Lord Nathar, Carl said, snapping to attention and touching his fingertips to the heart of the spread wings on his chest, fingertips tapping softly. Shall I send men to stand watch with you? I don't doubt that you have not slept. Even the guardian of Merrick must sleep every once in a while. His brows rose, or so I've heard. Nathar shook his head, smiling tiredly. No, your men must watch over each other. I have my sight to watch over me. Carl inclined his head respectfully, spun on his heel in a twirl of red cloak and marched back down the hall. Nathar's grin vanished as he watched the captain depart, knowing full well that he would never see him alive again. Goodbye, my friend, he whispered, eyes litting against the, the ache of remorse. Then they snapped open again as Queen Lenoa screamed. An instant later, a baby's cry tentatively took flight. Should we stop there? Yeah, no, that was that was powerful. So we've got the that's our main character who just got born. Or are we going to stick with the uh, uh, Nathar? Nathar is the main character. Okay. And but the Crown Prince uh, was just born, and he is also a main character, but he uh, much more in, in later books. Oh, okay. So for this first book, we are hanging out with Nathar, who we've just been we just heard in his own words. And so, and he's got this power of the sight, which I'm guessing is sort of, you can see glimpses into the future mm -hmm. or is it more than just a glimpse? Well, he sees glimpses into the future. He sees uh, sometimes into the past a lot. Sometimes he will touch things and he will see their history. Sometimes he touches people and sees history or the future, which can be, disturbing especially if like they're shaking hands or something like that because then if it's really powerful then he might freeze holding on to them which uh, can be unnerving uh, especially when then people say don't move don't 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 bother him that's dangerous um does anybody does anybody actually move do we find out what happens if somebody sort of breaks that sort of concentration and and into that um vision that he's having yes the, the every book starts Every book, chapter one is sight. So every one of the books starts with him having, uh, you know, him being seized by the demon of sight and seeing into the future. And in book four, someone um, disturbs him and it is, uh, it's very violent. And someone disturbs him and then someone else intervenes. 
and because he knows what's going to happen. And so he intervenes to, uh, because the person who disturbs him uh, wouldn't be able to deal with it as well. I gotcha. Now you said the demon of sight. So it's, is it like a magical ability or is he possessed of a demon that gives him the visions or they believe the visions come from the demons that, oh, cause it sounded like we also have some, um, some other sort of powerful deities wandering around. Well, um, in this case, it's demon as in D-A-E-M-O-N. And the idea came from, uh, well, in college, I, one of my degrees is in philosophy. And one of my one of the things that really fascinated me was Socrates, and Socrates talked about being well. He wrote things were written about Socrates. He didn't do his own writing, but he would talk about being seized by the demon of philosophy, and he would go into a trance-like state, and he would come out of it with these epiphanies, these really profound um, things that that he would come out of them with. And so I wanted to write a character that was kind of like that. And so when I started writing the new blood saga, then that was that opportunity. So Nathar is seized by the, the demon of sight. And so that is, that's what that is. He has that ability. It's tied to his first blood, his old blood. And he, sometimes it's little glimpses that are just quick. Sometimes it grabs him and he is frozen. Like we saw there, there, there was, a, you know, at least one moment where he was like a statue. He was frozen. And so it, it varies in degree, and their part of the trick is learning how to interpret it. Mm -hmm. And in his case, his father was guardian of merit before him. And so he had a lot of preparation, a lot of training in how to do it where a lot of people didn't. And But then at the same time, his dad was sort of a failed guardian. That how did he, he fail? Well, he wasn't able to deal with knowing all these horrible things were coming. He didn't deal with it as well as um, in the end, it became too much for him. Gotcha. And, and you also, I, I see there's mention of actual demons of chaos. So we've got Damon, which is not, which is sort of like the way he, they rationalize the, the sight or the ability is something coming on them. And then it sounds like we also have actual demons of chaos. So let, let's find out about that. That's, I'm interested in that. <laughs> demons of chaos are the embodiment of destruction. And so they are creatures that uh, in history, they were the um, the nemeses of the old gods. And so they were at war wherever the old gods came from. And they were at war. And so the old gods were creating the, uh, the great beasts as an army to fight against the demons of chaos. And so all of these different creatures were created as soldiers to fight against the demons of chaos. And there's various things that are that were created there were things like dragons there were things that were a lot of these things that you might see in mythology and then and they might be a lot of different things that, that you'd think yeah that's a that's a serious destructive force that different parts of, of different creatures all kind of mash together a lot of the the kind of demi-human type creatures are, the, are these kinds of things and then the last of the great beasts created were the firstborn. So they were the last of the great beasts, but they were the first race of mankind. And so then the mankind as hu what you might call just human is the ah ah. And they came later. Okay. Okay. That's that's I was going to ask about them because I, I was not totally clear who the ah ah were from the it's only been the first chapter so obviously there's a whole lot more to discover but i it sounded like they were like the first race of that was you know or first people or something like that mm -hmm. so in in your blurb you say that this is an epic fantasy exploring tyranny and humanity's eternal fight for freedom so who is the is the demons of chaos the tyrant or is the tyrant the guy that nathar is is guarding or so where's that tyranny come in? Because that caught um, my attention. I was like, I need some more info about that. Well, Brant of the Green is the usurper. And, you know, the, they do, uh, 
Well, Eric does fall, and that's part of the, the whole point is that they're saving the crown prince to come back to reclaim the throne. And so Bran to the Green, what the reason for this whole war of succession mm -hmm. is that a few generations back, there was a king who was killed in battle, and his son was this great noble figure. But when his father was killed and in this great war that was very, um, if you want to compare it to something modern, maybe you could compare it to even like a sort of a, maybe even like a Vietnam experience. It changed him. And so this, his heir became king, but he came back twisted. He came back sort of insane. And he came, so he came back and started, um, doing some things that shouldn't be done. And is that in book one or is that in future books? Well, you you hear about it as history and you don't see it. Okay. And so you hear about it as history. And so this guy gets deposed and he gets removed from the throne and his younger, younger siblings are twins. And no one ever established who would be, who would succeed after him because this first guy was such a, grand figure that nobody ever thought well what if, what if something happens to him because he was such a great everything and so um and nobody recorded which one of them was even born first of the twins and so they chose somebody and the you know the the advisors they chose somebody and there was talk that it was for political reasons and you know things like that and the one who wasn't chosen led a rebellion and it was put down, and then all the followers of that guy, then they were all uh, banished. And so they keep coming back, wanting to reclaim the throne. So now, it's a couple of generations later, Bran to the Green is part of that line. And he's coming back saying, no, we are the ones who are should truly be on the throne. And it's the first time that someone in his line has been successful in a lot of things you see some of that you see a lot of the the combat it's the first time you know it mentions i mentioned in the reading that riverside gate was breached twice it's the first time that's happened and there's some other things you see some of the combat you see uh you know some of that in in the first three chapters you see when uh when they have to escape you see a lot of the, the preparations that were made over decades preparing for this to happen because Nathar and his father before him knew that it was coming. And so they're one of the things that Nathar and his father have found is that even though they know that things are coming, if you try to prevent these things from happening, a lot of times it makes them worse. And so you have to, the only thing that you can do is try to prepare or things that about them that are changeable, then you can affect those things. And so they have been making uh, plans and preparations and the preparations, some of them are really involved that take decades of labor to, to make those preparations. And you see that when they escape Carrie. So that, that branch of the green comes back and takes the throne and mm -hmm that sends our heroes into flight and they need to come back and reclaim the throne. Mm -hmm. it, so, and that all happens in book one, or is that across multiple books? The fall of Eric and them fleeing is in book one. And so you, a lot of that is with uh, the crown prince as a baby. And then uh, uh, Nathar flees with Darshel, who is the wet nurse. And, uh, Part of that is that you get to see there's a lot of stuff with Nathar and Darshel. And Darshel is, well, she's Kwanese, which is a, uh, it's a nation that is uh, from another continent. And so there's a lot of stuff with some cultural differences and some things like that that makes for some pretty interesting views of society that, you know, there's a lot of, there's some discussions about just, uh, the roles of, of of women that in Kwani society women are viewed uh, much more positively in a lot of ways than in Merrick. Merrick is much more traditional European 
And uh, so there's some things like that with some discussions that that happen that are, um, I have a lot of women that, that comment about those discussions and how she was a woman, a woman ahead of her time is, is the comment I get a lot. But there are a lot of cultures that, that were like that at that time. So you have Nathar, you have Darshel, and you have them traveling with a newborn and a lot of that that's involved. And a lot of that is pretty real. I, I you know, five kids. So uh, a lot of that's pretty real and traveling and all the things involved with that and the ways that Nathar, who pretty much he's a soldier and all these preparations, yet he didn't really plan for the impact or didn't really understand because a lot of the stuff that he sees, he has to interpret. But he didn't really understand all the things involved in traveling with a newborn. And so a lot of the stuff that he planned, well, he didn't plan for that. Didn't oh, plan yeah. for that. Two That's... generations of men. Wow. Of course. You know, so there's a lot of that. And it's uh, and then he also didn't plan that, that uh, for, for the influence that Darshell would have herself and on him. Oh, that's that's interesting. Now, uh, you said that he is he's a soldier, but he has these visions. So, like, what if he has one of those in the middle of, like, some kind of conflict? Does, are there people who protect him while he's zoned out doing the vision thing? Well, does he, he have does, his own guards. He does have things like that, that happen during combat. However, he doesn't freeze. What he typically has during combat is about the combat. And one of the things that he has a discussion with Darshell about how did he become guardian of Merrick? Because she's asking him questions. Like she knows who he is. And so uh, he says that his father was in that role before him. And she says, oh, it's, it's hereditary. And he says, no. And there's a tournament. And she says, but only firstborn can be guardians. And he says, no, that would be illegal, basically. What, yeah. what is it with the firstborn thing and why why is there the importance or the why would it be elite why because there was, there was a whole lot about the firstborn in there and that was all right go, go on about this and then i want to know about that <laughs> only the firstborn can have sight it's, why it's, is that it's something with their how they were created it's one of the things that they were created with uh one of the things that the old gods created all these creatures with a purpose. And so that's one of the things that they have as part of their nature is the, is sight. Now, when you, you say firstborn, because you have it in cap, you have it capitalized as one word in 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 your, I think it was in your blurb, I think I saw it. And um, so is that like firstborn, meaning like you're a specific, like, like you're the first race that was created and they're descendants of it, or firstborn just literally meaning you are the firstborn in your family? Yes, there's there's multiple meanings. One is that you're the firstborn or the first uh, race of men, and so th they're called the firstborn. The first man created, it, his name is Merrick, Merrick firstborn, and the nation of Merrick is named after him because that's where he was created, in 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 the center of this nation called Merrick. And so his name is Merrick firstborn. And so the, the first race is named the firstborn. And so um, and so the, the firstborn lost the, the uh, uh conquest. They were forced down basically off the edge of the world is at how it's pretty much the intent. And the last survivors um, had to cross to a, a fairly large island and the people that are on the the main continent, they do have uh, traces of lineage because you can tell because they're taller and you know broader shoulders, things like that. You can see that the further that you go in that direction, the more you see that. But when you cross to the other continent that's in the other direction, then you don't see that at all. They're they're all much shorter, and uh, you don't see that. And one of the things that is kind of a racial slur that you see later is calling somebody a giant and so then because it's saying that they're calling you uh somebody with you know with first blood or old blood then they'll call you a giant and it's a racial slur 
and but because later the views of the firstborn gets a lot worse and that's that's part of the influence of brant and uh you know his his influence you know as the the king of merrick so he's not a firstborn or anything no and the demons of chaos are they were eventually conquered by uh, the old gods and all of the the various great beasts and the firstborn and all that and they were banished and uh, there's a lot of stories about that a lot of legends there's a lot of, of of reveals about that and how that happened throughout the books and are, are they coming back and well I guess I can just leave it as <laughs> You'll have to read I, to find out. <laughs> I, just, I guess I could just leave it as yes. And so I'll just leave it at that, but there's, but yes. And they come back and they are very insidious. And they come back in ways that. What do they want? Like what's their, what's their end game? Like what are they after? They are, well, like I said, they are the embodiment of destruction. And what they enjoy most is to destroy, to inflict pain, to, to anything that is orderly and um, if they can disrupt, then they will. I see. And if it takes a long time to do it, then they're okay. With doing it well i'm assuming that they're immortal so what is time to someone who doesn't ever die mm -hmm. and you know and there's there's some stuff with that that uh you know when we were talking before this uh this broadcast um one of the things in my books is that there is magic but you never hear the word magic in any of these books and so how that works is um one of the ways it works is tied in with the demons of chaos okay okay so the magic system is is linked to them in some way that at least one aspect of it yes okay i'm the opposite i think i mentioned magic like everywhere <laughs> all the time <laughs> but i have a mage as a main character in most books mm -hmm. so well, that's awesome. Is there anything else that you want to say about the book or the series? Uh, you said that there's four books out and there's, is there going to be a fifth or like, so where, where are we, what can we expect from the series? Is there like an, is it an open-ended series? It like, like Dresden, which you've been going on for a long time, or does it have a definitive end? There are eight books in the series. They are all written and four of them are out. The fourth book, Rilari, came out in February. And the one thing is that when I was writing them, one of the things, it was just flowing so well that I wanted to get it all out. And so there were places where I knew that I was going to flesh that out later. And then in later books, some of them I did. I fleshed that out there. And so then I would come back and fill in the blanks a little bit. Well, Rilari got really thick. And, you know, we were talking again, you know, before the show started, um, Crown Prince um, is this thick. And every book after that gets thicker. And so Order of Light is a little thicker. Demon Seed is a little thicker. Rilari is a little thicker. And so Rilari, I realized how thick it was getting. And so I took four chapters and put them in the next book, which is called Vengeance Born. And so it's eight books, but... There might be, I might have to pull a Tad Williams. Um, Tad Williams in, uh, what was it? Uh, I've read a bunch of his books. I'm just struggling to think about like, what does pull a Tad Williams? <laughs> what did he do oh, that I'm not aware of? It was, uh, oh crap, I'm, now I'm blanking on the name of the series. But it was a, it was a trilogy and it ended with uh, in Green, Green Angel Tower. Oh crap. It was a trilogy with... Uh, that it was a trilogy for it was always promoted as a trilogy and then he ended up doing book part one and part two of the third book oh okay 
and I might end up doing that with book eight, but we'll see. And well, then so just I'm, then it's a nine book series, and then you can do three box. You can do three uh, uh, omnibuses with three books each in them. Well, we'll see. And but it, it's but it it's an eight book series, and um, Nathar is the main character. And the, there are, there's a lot of twists and turns. There's a lot of changes. One of the things that um, I was reading something by Stephen R. Donaldson that he wrote about drama. And one of the things that he wrote that really struck me was that the definition of drama is that every story has a protagonist, an antagonist, and a victim. And the definition of drama is how your characters change roles from one of those to the other. And that just really struck me as being very true. And so in my books, there is a lot of that. People change roles. And so there is a lot of stuff where I, my, I call my stuff realistic fantasy. There's a lot of stuff where even though it's fantasy, they are living real lives. There are real things that happen. The stuff when they're traveling with a baby, that's real. That's real stuff. When there are things that people ask me that, how did you come up with that? This you know, form of torture or whatever it might be. And I said, well, they were doing that in England until, you know, 1860s or something like that. It's, I do a lot of research and, and try to make it as real as possible. And a lot of that, because it, for one thing, it gives it that authenticity that makes it very, um, very palpable, very, very, you can touch it, you can feel it, you can smell it. And so the, a lot of the characters you get to where you really feel for them. And the thing that inspired this series, I was having a recurring dream that would leave me in tears. And I was having this dream for months. And when I started writing a book about it, I realized that I, I couldn't do it in one book. And so then I, I decided I was gonna write a trilogy. And by the time I was in the third book, I realized I'm not even to that dream yet. So what that dream is in book four. And then the next books are dealing with the repercussions of that. But there's a lot of the, the stuff. There are characters in here that I just say the name of a character and my wife will get angry oh, no. or sad or something like that. There's a lot of people in here that you, you really get to love. You really get to hate. I love those characters that you love to hate. I love those characters that you just love. I love those characters that, that they do something and you think, oh, no, you know, because people make mistakes. They key off of the wrong things or they have these epiphanies and you think, man, you are so smart. I love those moments. And so there's a lot of that where you see people who they say the wrong thing and it sets somebody off. It hits a hot button. And I like that. I, I like those types of things. And so one of the, the greatest, well, I'll skip that, but. Oh, no. <laughs> We almost got you to reveal another spoiler. Well, one of the most common comments I've had is people saying that my New Blood saga is like a blend of Tolkien and Game of Thrones. And by that, I mean the books, not the show. The show was a lot yeah. racier than the books. I mean, there, there was stuff that was in the shows that was in the books, but to make the show appealing to be on TV they took a lot of the stuff that was in the books and just kind of crammed it all together. And the books are not nearly as, as graphic as what was in the shows. I have to admit that I, when the first Game of Thrones book came out, I got a copy, I read 50 pages, I didn't like it. So really? I have only read the first 50 pages of the first book of the Game of Thrones. I watched about 30 minutes of the first episode of the first season, and then my sister changed the channel and I didn't stop her. <laughs> So it's no. not my cup of tea. I love the Lord of the Rings, but it's, I'm not, I don't, I don't like the dark gritty fantasy. Um, yeah. I just, I don't, I, it wasn't an escape, but I was seeking escape and it wasn't an escape. It was too, it was too much the things that I don't like about the real world, you know, mm -hmm. but in a, in a fantasy place with more of it, like sort of crammed together. And I was like, eh, I don't want to. Yeah, mine isn't, isn't as dark. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I love the books. I think that Martin is one of the few who really understands medieval politics that, cause a lot of people, I don't think that they get the medieval politics. A lot of the, the fantasy writers, I don't think they do. I 
it's yeah i didn't like reading medieval politics so yeah i i don't even bother i don't even i don't i don't write politics unless i absolutely have to and i yeah i don't like it so (laughs) it's not my cup of tea i like fun fantasy adventures but uh well for an example of, of medieval politics that there's a woman who who is another one who i think really understands it her name's melanie ron and she wrote the uh the Dragon Prince trilogy and then the, the trilogy that followed. And one of the things with her is that they're all of her bad guys are her worst bad guys are all women. And there'll be stuff like they'll have these big elaborate plans. And when they start to come apart, the men will be like, well, then I'll just kill you. But then the women will be like, I can wait and I'll marry your son. And just, I don't know. It just, to me, that just seems just, just really evil. But anyway, she understands medieval politics really well also. And a lot of the stuff with arranged marriages and and those types of things that uh, I think Martin really gets. But anyway, I'm I'm not as dark as that, but I think that uh, it's not a bad assessment to see, to say that there's some of that. I have uh, songs in my stuff that, uh, I'm going to see about having some, uh, I know somebody who has expressed some interest in writing music for them and, uh, that would be cool. I'm going to see if he really wants to do it or if he's just talking. That would be uh, very cool. You could include that in the audiobook version that you were telling me that you're working on. So obviously there's yeah. no timeline for that, but you know, just wanting to let listeners know yep. that that is something that's in the works for book one and eventually the other books as well. So this has been fantastic. We're we're running a little bit over time, but it's been a great conversation. It's an interesting book. I'm not into politics, but I was going to comment that the first chapter, it was giving me like um, Name of the Wind vibes, um, just the, the writing style. Um, so yeah, I just want to mention that just the way that it's the way that you go back and forth. There's a, the frame of the, the birth and them, them talking and then just all the history and stuff. Like it felt very name of the wind uh, to me. Um, well, I haven't read it. So oh. I, <laughs> I did read that one when it came out. I, 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 I have over, I've listened to over a thousand fantasy books. I'm not afraid to say <laughs> slightly addicted, just very slightly, you know, the TBR is groaning in the corner because it's so big. There's still so many books that I want to read uh, still, but this has been fantastic. So we'll have all the links down there that they can find you and find your book so they can check it out and meet Nazara on their own and hope that we provided a good introduction in this. Um, yeah. So thank you so much. Any last words? Well, thanks for having me. I, the The support from the writing community has been amazing. The critics has been amazing. Uh, my first four books have gotten 17 book awards. And oh, wow. It's been just humbling. And so I just really appreciate the readers sending me pictures of them holding my books. And I just don't even know how to describe that. It's just very, very cool. And That's so awesome. I, I just appreciate everybody who's been doing all that and people like you uh, asking me to do this. And, and it's just been awesome. So and thank- you're, you're also in the, um, the self published fantasy blog off number nine as well. Yes. You're part of, I'm getting the name by the end of it. I'll be able to say it without having to mentally imagine the words. <laughs> I'm in the same boat. Yep. I have to sit there and figure it out and look at it. Yeah. Yeah, so hopefully you'll advance to semifinals. I'm hoping I do too, but we'll we'll find out. We've got many months yet, so um, hopefully you'll do well. And um, I am Luna Cusera, your indie fantasy author. I write fantasy adventures about families and magical creatures who are just trying to survive in a world that hates and fears magic but is steeped in it. And yeah, and my book, Chris Baker and Jen, is also part of SPFBO9, which has 300 books can enter. 10 books advanced to semifinals and one book will be crowned the winner. I don't know if there's anything for second place, but that's, the, that's what I've heard about it. And um, this has been fancy Lauren Moore with WD Kilpack the third. So thank you all so much. And hopefully we'll see you back next time for another chat about fantasy books. Thank you.